Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this second seminar in the series Rising to the Challenge, What Will It Take to Decarbonise Transport? Um, I remind you that this session will be recorded for later broadcast uh, on the internet. I do hope you've had a chance to look at the recording of the first seminar, if you didn't hear it uh, as it happened. Um, I encourage you to do that. Uh, if you if you are able to do it, you'll see an excellent keynote speech from Lord Deben. In my words, uh, one of his main points was to praise the government for uh, defining so many um, uh, uh, targets for carbon uh, reduction. But his second point was to criticise the government for having uh, so little evidence about how they were going to meet uh, their aspirations, and that leads us very nicely to today's session which is about um, what governments could and should be doing um, to encourage people to make lower carbon travel choices. Um, looking at the list of speakers for the day, um, I'm enormously impressed by what a wealth of expertise. There are so many um, distinguished people who are members of distinguished um, trusts uh, and other bodies who've been researching this subject for years and many of us have been saying much the same thing for the last 20 30 years without actually um succeeding in persuading government to do very much i hope we'll uh, have more to say on uh, suggestions for government to push this whole thing along so let's get started i'm going to introduce now claire haig who's Chief Executive of Green Transport Solutions to introduce our session. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much, Stephen. Yes, and um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second in a series of webinars, which is the publication of a manifesto for decarbonising transport. Um, and first, I'd like to extend my sincerest thanks to Adelshaw Goddard, who are kindly sponsoring these events. I'd also like to thank the Foundation for Integrated Transport, who are providing grant funding to oversee the development of the manifesto, and last but definitely not least, um, my big thanks, biggest thanks to the Greener Transport Council, who are overseeing this project and without whose support, none of this would be happening. So the purpose of the Rising to the Challenge series is to focus attention on the changes needed to achieve net zero. And on Monday, um, we did look at the wider economy, the changes needed to the wider economy. That was the focus of our first discussion. I'm going to sort of recap on a few of the conclusions from Monday to sort of set the scene for today. I mean, it was absolutely agreed that transport is intricately bound up with every aspect of our lives, and we simply cannot consider the decarbonisation of transport in isolation. So there was a, a clear consensus that we need an economy-wide whole systems approach. I mean, it was felt that the siloed nature of government often militates against the joined up approach needed. Um, for example, you know, to prevent new housing developments from building in car dependency. Um, it was seen that uh, there was an opportunity for, in the forthcoming Black Planning Bill um, to create an assumption um, that any planning decision should further the goal of reaching net zero. So um, digitalization has clearly, clearly increasingly drives large parts of the economy, as we've all experienced during the pandemic. And it was felt on Monday that we should be doing an awful lot more to capitalize on what we've learned from the pandemic in terms of you know, remote working, working from home. But whilst also recognizing that not everyone can work from home, so there would be serious social equity issues if we were to create a two tier workforce. I mean, another experience from the pandemic and something that commented, commented very much on Monday was that the massive increase we've seen in online deliveries, which has really highlighted how crucially we need a more efficient system for freight and logistics. And we have to get away um, from this expectation of next day delivery that is just simply crazy. It's not sustainable. It's not going to take us to a sustainable model for freight. We have to move away from that. Um, it was also felt that we should be doing an awful lot more to harness private investment. I mean, the investment needed um, to decarbonise transport is going to cost a lot. An awful lot, it will be more than we can um, achieve from the fare box or the taxpayer. Um, there was a feeling that, you know, there's, there's private finance out there. There is money to invest, but someone, one, one of the members commented that to some extent, private finance has been left out in the cold. Um, it was also felt that we need to do an awful lot more 
to support, support local authorities who, after all, were going to be really on the ground making a lot of this happen. Um, this is a theme which undoubtedly will come up again today, um, but is going to be central to our discussion on Monday, which where we'll be focusing on the role next Monday, the, the role of um, localism in um, driving decarbonisation. But we also discussed um, that we, we really reflected on Monday just how profound the changes needed to required are going to need to be if we're going to succeed. Um, it's not just about changing travel behaviour. We need a shift in consumer behaviour. We need to consume less. We need to move to a more circular economy. Ultimately, and I quote, this will require a transformation of the economy um, and a restructuring of society. Um, in her brilliant book, um, The Future We Choose, which if you haven't read, I urge you to read, Christiana Figueres, the principal architect of the 2015 Paris Agreement, you highlights the harsh reality that to have even a 50% chance of success, we have to cut global greenhouse gas emissions by a half their current levels by 2030, by half again by 2040, and then zero by 2050. She says that a change of this magnitude, and I'm quoting directly now from her book, will require a major transformation in almost every area of our lives, Attempting to change while we are informed by the same state of mind that has been predominant in the past will lead to insufficient incremental changes. In order to open the space for transformation, we have to change how we think and fundamentally who we perceive ourselves to be. I mean, clearly, the scale of change needed um, is going to be at times uncomfortable for the public. Um, it will certainly present challenges for politicians. Um, and it was reflected, reflected on Monday that we're going to need to appeal to people in their role as citizens, not just as consumers. So as Stephen has already mentioned, today we're going to be examining more closely the role of central government. Um, there is currently a worrying lack of engagement um, with the public by central government, which is especially concerning when we consider that two, some two thirds of future emissions reductions are going to rely on individual choices and behaviours. I mean, all the easy wins in terms of decarbonising the power sector have happened. So we're now onto the hard stuff. Um, there are concerns that government policy is failing to match up to its rhetoric, as Stephen has already mentioned. I mean, Lord Deben concluded that you know, we should absolutely praise government for, these, for setting world leading targets, which undoubtedly send a clear signal to the rest of the world. We do need to celebrate that. But these targets are not credible without matching delivery plans. Now, today, um, we're going to be looking particularly at the role of behaviour change. I mean, there's a heavy reliance in government policy on technology solutions, and we have these targets, and that's all great. However, we will still need a significant reduction in traffic on our roads. So the Scottish Government has pledged a 20% cut in car kilometres by 2030. Should the UK government be doing something similar? Do we need a gov government target along those lines for the UK as a whole? Pricing is going to be key. So every mode of transport should be priced according to its environmental impact. Um, it should be cheaper to use public transport than to drive and to fly. But as we all know, too often that is not the case. Um, but crucially, this has to be achieved while ensuring a fair and just transition to net zero. Um, the Yellow Vest protests in Paris are a good illustration of how the public will react to a measure that it doesn't perceive to be fair. So what sort of mitigation measures would, we, would make increasing fuel duty acceptable and prevent it from being perceived as a regressive tax hike? It's clear that electric vehicles are not a panacea, and this is absolutely very, very much agreed on Monday. I feel this is, this is something that we're interested in the views today, but. This is a strong, a strong sense that you know, the problem with relying on technological solutions without giving in sufficient, um, sufficient ex a focus on behavior change is that we run into the problem with rebound effects. So we saw increases in um, tr transport emissions post 2013 with the sizable improvements, you know, vehicle efficiency um, being eroded by the trend to larger vehicles and rising demand for car and van travel. And moreover, um, if we electrify the car fleet without replacing fuel duty, 
road traffic could increase by an additional 30% as the cost of running a car fall dramatically. Has the time finally come to implement national road user charging? How does the government take the public with it on the journey to net zero? Um, and you know, what will be the role of deliberative democracy? What can we learn from citizens' assemblies? Will nudges be enough? Or do we need to start a big open conversation with the public? That was very much the view on Monday, um, I think shared by almost all. Um, I think it was Paul Campion that made the point that um, to successfully do this, we need better stories. So I'm sure there'll be plenty of views on this today. I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from the panel. Um, these are just really just some of the questions we're going to be exploring in this second session, which will focus very much on the technical and policy solutions needed um, if government is going to encourage people to make lower carbon travel choices. So thank you all very much for joining um, and I look forward to our discussion. You're on mute, Stephen. I'm so glad to be the first person to say that. <laughs> Somebody did that to me. <laughs> uh, thank you, Claire. Look, two details. Um, you mentioned just in your remarks just now, today is about central government, which it is, but uh, of course we're not excluding local government and regional government from this, because I think we Absolutely. all understand they have to be part of the story. Um, and we will be giving some more attention to regional and local government in the uh, session next week. Uh, second, um, I've had a request for the exact reference to the book you cited just now. Yes, so, um, and, and actually we can, uh, oh, I'm not very really good at putting this, it's, it's, it's um, The Future We Choose, um, Christiana Fugreras, um, and, and it was published it, literally just this year, I mean, I think it came out a couple of months ago. Um, is that enough? Thank you. Well, perhaps it can be put in writing somewhere in, in, the, yes. in the session. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Well, I'll put it in when I I'll put it in, I'll put it in when I we finish chatting, Stephen. Right. Now we are due a keynote speech from Hugh Merriman, MP. Um, he's not able to join us in person today because he's been called to the House of Commons. He has promised us a video version of his speech. But it's not um, ready to show you just yet, so I'm going to move straight on to the first panel discussion and hopefully we can have the video um, when we've got to the end of that. So, first of all, uh, an old colleague and friend of mine, um, Professor Phil Goodwin, who's now a senior fellow at the Foundation for Integrated Transport. Phil. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, here's the problem we've got. For over 30 years, we've been agreeing policy statements about reducing transport's contribution to CO2 production and to climate change. And during that period, the amount of CO2 emitted by transport has increased. And that's because I think good long-term intentions have always been subverted by short-sighted decisions on resource allocation and on infrastructures. Climate change is now with us and its future will be determined by what happens in the rest of this decade, not ha what happens in the build-up to 2050. And what follows, it seems to me, is three consequences. First, immediacy. The flagship electrification of vehicles through new sales makes little difference at all in the next 10 years. Carbon vehicles are themselves getting bigger and last too long. That's why overall traffic, vehicle miles traffic, will have to reduce as well. So the main test now of a successful long-term plan is the radical measures which can have the biggest effect in the shortest time period. And there's one clear winner on that front, speed limits. 20 miles an hour default for towns and 60 for motorways gets huge benefit for very little cost. Concerning cycling and walking, the main constraints are regulation and enforcement. 
which if there is political will, can be faster than new infrastructure. Allocation of road capacity, enforcement on illegal behavior, restrictions on access for polluting, for the most polluting vehicles, all can be done swiftly. I'll say again, if there is political will, without that, of course, we're lost anyway. Second, consistency. Don't adopt parking policies which undermine traffic policies or price structures which embed car dependence. A full road pricing system has always been described as 10 years away for at least the last six decades, but taxes are changed every year. Every year in which the money cost of car use is so much less than its social cost, so much less than public transport fares, is a contribution to making climate change worse, not better. So tax carbon, it's easy. This can raise more money than increasing national insurance contributions, more equitably, more beneficially. And the first stage, fossil fuel for transport, just as swiftly. Third, the effect of climate change on transport. The levies in New Orleans worked this time and were a tribute to a massive civil engineering investment. But the New York subway system failed catastrophically and the whole system closed down. Climate change does not only affect sea levels, it also affects storms, all water flows, rivers, canals, runoff, and indeed water supply, drainage and sewage. We will need civil engineers and infrastructure investment, but for protection, not for road schemes designed for futures which are no longer possible. Transport has to be flexible, able to respond swiftly to emergencies and to contribute both to limiting the extent of climate change and being able to operate in changed climate conditions. And therefore mass transport will, I think, become even more dependent on buses whose routing and services are inherently flexible, but need to be higher quality, more reliable and cheaper. There will be new rail systems, especially in cities where they are vital, but I'd say that we might need to be very wary of tunnelling for obvious reasons. Trams, not metros. Therefore, more reallocation of road space. Uh, finally, just a comment on the new carbon appraisal values. They admit that carbon has been drastically undervalued, and that admission is very welcome. But appraisal values are not prices. They're still lower than the value of the damage caused, and they are only one of a dozen other embedded barriers against taking proper account of, in, of climate change in appraisal. So the new values won't make a big difference to the actual projects chosen unless the other barriers are tackled at the same time. Uh, that's my five minutes, Stephen. Thank you very much. And over to the next. Um, thank you, Phil. Uh, the, the, the carbon values you were just referring to are the ones published uh, within the last uh, few days by the by Bayes uh, in their um, official values to be used in uh, project appraisal within government. Um, I just had occasion to look at that document. It, it's a really excellent document. It does show that there are parts of government who absolutely understand um, how to go about uh, calculating a sensible price for carbon. The difficulty, of course, is that um, it's not greatly used in practice by other parts of government, in, in my view. And secondly, your point about um, the speed with which taxes and charges can be changed if there is a will at the highest level of government is really very well made. And you only have to look at what happened last night in the House of Commons and how to, to see how quickly action can be taken if there is a will at the highest 
level within government as distinct from changing the vehicle technologies and land use planning and all of that stuff which is good good to do but will take decades to have much effect anyway thank you phil uh, our next um speaker is luke ravenscroft who is lead director on energy environment and sustainability in the behavior insights team the main point i want to make is on the use of uh, behavior change um I, I think sometimes we sort of get caught and i probably not for a lot of people in the school, but get caught into the trap of thinking about the possible options for decarbonizing. You know, is it technological adoption? Is it legislative change? Or is it behavior change? And thinking about these things is quite different. And, and I really think I sort of argue against that. And I think, you know, the CCC themselves say that it's about nearly two thirds of the emissions we need to avoid will involve some sort of behavior change. But the truth is, a lot of that is the combination of behavior and, and the technological adoption. But I really think sort of behavior change can really offer, I think, a, a lot on, on, on three different sort of levels. One is supporting the big policy decisions. You know, the title of the, uh, the talk has taxes in, so supporting those kind of decisions, then supporting the technolo technological change. It's not just making it available and, and, and the price okay, it's gonna make people suddenly adopt it. And, and the final part is on, on the public and bringing the public support and understanding kind of alongside. Um, so yeah, I think taking those in turn, I mean, taking the policy design, I think a lot of the challenges, a lot of people are sort of talking in today's session and, and in the last one about introducing a new tax or, or a new policy, but there's a lot of political challenges which come attached to those. And I think trying to understand those barriers and, and, and I think behavioral science can offer answers to those questions. Indeed, I think when the, when the sugar tax was being considered, two of the big challenges that were put forward were one, it's not really gonna change anyone's behavior and therefore it's really gonna hurt poor people particularly and be regressive. And the second was, it's gonna lose businesses a lot of money. And indeed, a set of experiments showed that both of those things weren't true and indeed kind of help support the reducing the barriers. And the same goes for, you know, if you think about the subsidies brought in for, let's say electric vehicles, is it better to bring them across the board or would it be better to bring them more pronounced for, for businesses? Because um, we know fleet vehicles, you know, they turn into secondhand cars quicker and most people, the vast majority of people buy secondhand cars. And that, when I spoke to people, that is one of the big barriers that the cost is very high at the secondhand level. So really there's one of kind of like, what are the questions, the, the barriers or the research questions on the introduction of money, the levies that people are suggesting. The second is on technology adoption and, and really kind of the interaction between behavioral interventions or what we might think of as behavioral interventions and getting the technology that makes it stick. And indeed, one kind of one of the most famous behavioral interventions in, in this area is you know, what Opower did where they send you, it's very familiar, they send you a report saying, and your energy consumption is high and you know, you're much higher than your neighbors. Now this is implemented for a long time. And the great thing about it being implemented for a long time is we can now go back and see what really happened. And indeed what they've done is they've looked at of all the places that's been intervention, what happens when people move house? So when someone moves house, do we see that the effect of those behavioral intervention disappears? Which would make sense if people were uh, lowering their heating, turning the lights off, making the kind of small behavioral adjustments. But actually what they see is about half of the effect remains. And that's because people fundamental changes to their households. So we see when the next household takes over, indeed the energy reduction holds. And I think that's an interesting example for how we try to get behavioral intervention that will interact with technology and get people to take on a new form and then that structural adjustment means those changes will stick and that's obviously kind of what we want um and then but the final point i'll make is on on the public i think a lot of people have seen kind of increased engagement and willingness around the public on climate change you see that from the latest zips of Mori study pwc one we've done our own which shows people are increasingly uh, worried about climate change and, and willing to change their behavior, including on transport itself. Um, but we still, see, we still see it lagging kind of in three really important ways. And again, I think this is where behavior change can help. One is action. 
you know, we, we've talked about that with the government, but we see that with, with people as well. Um, people report a strong willingness to make changes, but, but only 50% of people have made any actions that, to change the lives of sport climate in the last six months. And that's no different, exactly the same from 2019. So we haven't seen the, the action come along. The, the second one is on, um, on sort of norms themselves. So if you ask people whether they support further action on climate change, 74% of others support this. They say 60% of people. So people are out there believing that they indeed support climate change, but most other people do, do not. Um, and that gap is something that really can, can be addressed to get, get kind of further support attached. Um, so I think, I think there's a kind of a number of elements where behavior change can play. Of course, that does not negate the, the sort of more traditional approaches for reducing demand for, let's say, aviation or, or modal shift. But I really think the important thing here is to think about behavior change supporting the other tools, because otherwise we end up in a sort of trapped in a conversation where people think the behavior change, behavioral interventions um, are kind of being used as cover to a degree because they will be smaller than making some of the big, big, important changes. I really would argue the opposite, that when it's well designed, it can support those big changes to really make them effective and not, you know, not backfire, not sort of be badly designed, not bring the public with it. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's the main thrust of what I would like to say. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Luke. Um, I, I hope um, everyone was able to hear that. Your bandwidth is a little bit um, low, but uh, the, 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 the audio was fine. Now, our next speaker is um, Greg Archer, who is UK Director of Transport and Environment. Um, Greg, uh, am I right in saying that Transport and Environment is a not-for-profit Pan-European think tank, is that a fair description uh, of the organisation? Very fair description. Thank you for the introduction. Well, thank you to, for inviting me this morning. I think it's fair to say that technology is now evolving at such a pace, it will enable transport to fully decarbonise by 2050. But even the speed of the shift which we're experiencing at the moment is not fast enough to enable us to meet our interim climate targets. We've simply started too late, and as, uh, as Phil said, the build-up of electric vehicles on our roads will simply be too slow. So alongside what are good government policies to accelerate the shift to electric vehicles, incentives for people to make that transition, regulations for the car industry to require them to supply those vehicles, and the investment in infrastructure to enable that transition to happen. We also need an equivalent amount of government um, effort in terms of reducing our car use as well. And the steps which need to be taken in terms of encouraging that uh, reduction in car use are much the same as the ones which need to be, which have been introduced to encourage electric vehicles. At a first step, we need government to actually acknowledge this must happen and set itself its own targets in order to actually measure its progress in reducing car use. Secondly, it needs to then transpose those targets down to a local authority level, so local authorities are then charged with delivering that reduction in car use uh, at, at, you know, that the government says is required. And then thirdly, we need to start to make the investments which are needed to actually enable that transition to happen and to send the right pricing signals to, to enable, to, to encourage people to make the shift. But to get drivers out of their cars, we cannot simply price them off the road. For far too long, green groups have argued that all we need to do is hike prices and people will change their behavior. Well, I'm sorry, but it's not going to happen because our ministers, our mayors and our councillors will not be willing to commit political suicide in doing so and making car use 
uh, inherently unattractive. So what we have to do is actually, rather than making car use more difficult, we have to level up the kind of services which are available uh, through public transport and to make public transport and active travel a better alternative than using the car. And above all, for active travel, that means making it much safer and providing secure places where people can leave their increasingly expensive bikes, particularly if those are electric bikes suitable for longer trips. And for our public transport system, it means enhancing the quality uh, and reliability of that public transport service. I was recently told a story about a change in Copenhagen where they introduced a fleet of electric buses with comfortable seats and Wi-Fi uh, and good public information systems as to where those buses were. And now people actually wait for an electric bus on the route, uh, an extra 10 minutes, rather than to get onto a bouncy, smelly diesel bus. And as a result, ridership levels on the buses in Copenhagen have risen as a result. So this successful transition is not about a competition between behavior change and technology. It's about the interface between technology and behavior change and policy in order to drive the right sorts of transitions. Now in our towns and cities, there is really little choice but to reallocate road space away from cars towards bikes and buses and trams and so forth. But if we try to do that now with our roads entirely clogged, uh, particularly during peak periods, we will inflame public opinion in the way that local transport, uh, local tra transport neighborhoods have done. So our first step must be to bring down the numbers of cars on our roads quickly by tackling some of the key causes of congestion, by rolling out much more expensive, uh, sorry, much more extensive uh, school travel planning to reduce that car, that school travel commute, um, encouraging car sharing, encouraging more school buses, and giving local authorities the resources to make sure that they can put those plans in place and schools the resources to coordinate that work. We need to work with major employers to, to encourage them to do much more with car sharing for their employees to reduce the number of cars traveling and commuting to work every day. And if we can quickly reduce the number of cars commuting during peak periods, then I think we can sh much more safely shift road space to more safe bike lanes, more bus lanes that will now then enable those buses to quickly speed through our towns and actually offer a faster service than traveling by car. And all the evidence points to the fact that if the bus is faster than the car, then a lot more people will be willing to get onto it. In our rural areas, I think we need to be far more imaginative about the way in which we operate our buses. On-demand buses, on-demand taxis that take people from their isolated villages, connect them to a fast bus service, a regular bus service between major towns is the right approach. We can know people no longer want to sit on a slow bus operating a few times a day, trundling from villages to village. We need to start thinking more imaginatively about how we deliver public transport in our rural areas, and we need to support the shift to electric bikes in particular by providing secure parking for those electric bikes at bus stops in rural areas to encourage people to cycle to the bus stop and then know that they can safely leave their bike. And finally, I think it is really important that we recognise that our rail service needs to be much more efficient. The the reality is that rail consumes over 50% of our transport budget and yet actually provides only about 10% of the passenger kilometre trips. We have to find ways of making our trains more efficient and cheaper, not just by giving them yet more subsidy, 
but by finding ways to drive costs out of the system so that they are really a credible alternative to families um, who otherwise will continue to use their cars because the train is simply too expensive. Road pricing will have a very important role in this process. It will make people aware of the costs of individual trips and it's therefore essential, uh, it will be an essential part of the mix. But there's an awful lot we, we can do before we introduce road pricing in order to make our public transport services better, to make it more attractive to, for, for people to walk and to cycle, um, and in particular to find alternatives to single people in our cars. If we do these things, then I believe that we can make a much more rapid transition encouraging people out of their cars and complement that with the shift to electric cars. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Greg. Um, you, ex you, you expressed some scepticism about the use of pricing because uh, you, in, in your words, uh, politicians would not be able to, not be willing to commit suicide. Do, do you think that in, in the light of what we heard from Luke Ravenscroft, public attitudes might be changing rapidly enough for that not to be the case? I mean, even in 2003, Ken Livingstone introduced the congestion charge. Uh, it was very concerning at the time, but actually it did not turn out to be political suicide for Ken. And that's because there was actually a large uh, body of agreement amongst the London population, London electorate, uh, about the need for it. They saw the point even then. I think what Ken Livingstone did, though, in, in the three years before he introduced the congestion charge, was to invest a massive amount in the bus services of London to really increase um, bus patronage and, 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 and bus services. So he had readied the, the, the population of London for that transition and provided an alternative to them. I don't think we can simply hike prices uh, for driving um, unless we have put in place really good alternatives for those people to use. Yes, I do think there is an, an, an important role for pricing. Um, and, and I do support the shift to, to uh, a, a road pricing system um, that, that prices both congestion and the type of vehicle that you're driving and the place that you're driving. But I don't think we should see it as a panacea that we can just price drivers off the road. We have to provide better alternatives to them first, and then there will be more acceptance of those uh, higher charges, which inevitably will have to come. Yeah, so you're, you're saying in a, in a different way what I think I would always say. You, one should never, ever get trapped into talking about a price or a tax change in isolation. You have to present a package where you're clear about what's going to happen to the revenues and that that the public can see a package which in some sense, at least some of them will, will find attractive as a package, as a thing from just paying a tax where you didn't pay one before. Um, thank you, we must, we must move on now. Um, uh, we, we're now going to hear from Susan Moyer, who is the Partner in Infrastructure Projects and Energy for Adelshaw Goddard. Now, Susan, um, Adelshaw Goddard are a, um, a business law firm, is that a fair description? Yeah, a business law firm would be a fair description, yes, and we have a, we operate along a sector approach, one of our key sectors is transport, which we're very involved in, hence why we're involved in this session today. So, um, yeah, so anyway, thanks, thanks Stephen, um, I'll just kick off. I suppose what I would say is, uh, many of the speakers, I think Monday and today, have highlighted that in terms of decarbonising transport, um, we now have lots and lots of policy and no shortage of ideas, but what we are short of is action and delivery and, and that we're running out of time. So my reflection on this, I suppose from a lawyer's perspective, is something of an ode to local government, highlighting just how important local government is going to be when it comes to actually delivering low carbon travel choices in a net zero economy. And I think that's a thought that many um, that have been on these two webinars have, have also agreed with. An example which I, I would like to use to illustrate this is the fantastic work which has been carried out by clients of Adelshaw Goddard Aberdeen City Council. 
to deliver the Council's vision of Aberdeen City as a world-class low-carbon economy. Now, the phrase you hear over and over again when discussing how to actually deliver low-carbon transport schemes is chicken and egg, and it goes something like this. We want to make the investment which is needed to supply low-carbon fuel, such as hydrogen, but the demand has to be there before we can raise the finance. And then in response, you'll get, but we can't invest in new hydrogen vehicles until we know the supply will be there and the price point will be good. At which point most of us put our heads in our hands and wonder how we'll ever get to net zero. But this is not, not local government, I would suggest. Over the last few years, local government has been working hard, studying the policies that have come out from central government, developing their sustainable energy action plans and other net zero plans and applying for funding for central government to deliver those plans. But I would suggest most critically of all, they have come to realise that to win the big prize, the nirvana of a low carbon economy for their region, local government must be both the chicken and the egg. So what does this mean? In Aberdeen City's case, this has meant the council being the first mover in both the demand and the supply sides of the nascent hydrogen economy in the city. The council has worked with the local bus company to obtain funding to subsidise a fleet of hydrogen buses, whilst at the same time the council has procured the hydrogen supply required to fuel those buses at an economic price point, performing the function of both the chicken and the egg. And now with those acorns sown, the council is moving on to the next stage by inviting the private sector to work in partnership with the council to take the hydrogen economy in the region to the next stage. What Aberdeen Council has recognised, in my view, is that it must be the catalyst for investment in the city's hydrogen production infrastructure. By investing in the vehicles that will create the demand for hydrogen fuel, whilst at the same time investing in the hydrogen supply infrastructure alongside its strategic private sector partner to ensure the supply will be economically viable. In addition to this supply and demand investment, the Council has also recognised the value which the public sector brings to the party when it shares with the private sector its understanding of central government policy and how it will be implemented. Sharing this understanding really helps the private sector to join the dots and to get to grips with both the opportunity and the risks associated with low carbon schemes and how those risks might be mitigated, all of which has to be articulated in any good investment case. For example, a simple example, how low emission zones in Scotland cities will drive the switch to low carbon fuels and will bake that switch into transport infrastructure going forward. So accepting that local government working in partnership with the private sector is going to be critical to delivering a low carbon, delivering low carbon transport. The final point I would make is this. Along with the chicken and egg problem, the other roadblock we as lawyers often encounter in our discussions with clients is how to structure these partnerships. Yes, the concept of a public-private sector partnership is not new, but many partnerships in the past have in reality been nothing more than glorified works or services contracts, the public sector paying for the delivery of a work or service delivered by the private sector. But the context in which we are working here demands something much more, something much more sophisticated. What is required is a real partnership or joint venture between the public and private sector, where both parties are engaged in creating the carbon economy, which will be necessary to deliver net zero. So the question becomes, what does that partnership look like? And to answer that question, the following issues have to be considered and addressed. Firstly, the public sector's contribution to the partnership has to be understood and valued. Secondly, the risk allocation between the parties has to be developed and may involve the public sector taking more or a different type of risk than they're used to taking due to the nascent state of the market which the partnership is trying to develop. Thirdly, 
The public sector's return on that investment has to be properly considered and defined. To what extent should the public sector participate in the returns from the partnership as the market develops and matures? And finally, how are these arrangements structured so that they comply with procurement law and subsidy control requirements? How should local government evaluate proposals from the private sector? What does good look like and how can it be evaluated when what we are procuring is a strategic partnership and not a road, a bridge or a tram? None of these issues are easy, but the more we think about them and the more we start to develop models around them, then the easier it will, it will become to engage private sector in the low carbon economy at a local level. Chris Stark, in his widely reported speech last week, emphasised that net zero would require a huge amount of private sector investment. I believe local government is key to unlocking that investment and those authorities that can find the political will and drive to innovate in the way they work with the private sector hold the key to developing the low carbon economies which will be required to deliver net zero. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. So what you're describing there is um, a local authority doing what government really should do. That's taking a lead and putting the institutional arrangements in place to make a market work when it wouldn't uh, with, without help. And, and as you say, one of the biggest issues is who is going to bear the ultimate commercial risk of this? Um, because there is always a big commercial risk. Um, do you see any role for, or what role do you see for the new National Infrastructure Bank, which um, the Westminster government have set up? I, I think with, with that kind of issue in mind, finding a way of defraying the commercial risks of this kind of partnership. I think they've, they've I mean, obviously got a big role to play. And I think we're already seeing in Scotland with the Scottish Infrastructure Bank, which is already, you know, the Scottish Bank, which has already been set up that they clearly have a role in, in, in financing um, some of these schemes. However, I think probably what I would say is um, when they're approaching some of these schemes, they're also going to have to adopt perhaps a different approach from the approach that's been um, adopted when people have been financing um, you know, projects in the past. The, the, the financing model needs to be developed to, to reflect the, you know, the, the, the nature of the market, the, what, the risks that are associated with developing those markets to make it, to make it a work, to, to, to develop workable models and workable solutions. Because quite yeah. often there's not a massive amount of money involved in these schemes. Yeah. So what, one of the issues to be clarified, I think, is, is the extent to which these infrastructure banks are uh, ways of funding or just simply financing? You know, is, is there real new public money coming in through the route of the banks? Or is it mm -hmm. uh, like the World Bank used to be, just a, a way of, of um, balancing its books over time, but providing short-term finance? Thank you. The next speaker is Professor Gillian Annabel, who's Professor of Transport and Energy at the University of Leeds. Is um, Gillian prepared to continue? Of course. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thanks, everyone. Um, start off on a, a strange note, maybe, um, and, and tell everyone that, that I'm actually really angry. Um, I'm angry, actually, at even the speakers so far on this webinar. Um, I'm angry then by implication, by association, probably with the listeners to this webinar. Um, and I'm angry with myself as well. Um, and there are two main reasons for that, and they're related. So the first one is that, that so far, really, only Phil has predicated what they've had to say on the fact that we only have this decade before we have blown it. Um, and in my view, everything that everyone says should be qualified with respect to the degree to which it meets. Uh, what we need to do over the next 10 years. Um, and uh, that is economy-wide, a 68% reduction in emissions by 2030. Transport has so far done zero. So it has one decade to achieve 
40 years worth of carbon reduction. Aviation isn't going to do that within the sector. HGVs aren't going to do that with the sector. It really does only come down to cars. That's almost a three quarters reduction by 2030. And yet all we have at the moment is a change in 2030 um, with some incremental change between now and then. The second reason is related uh, to this immediacy issue, as Phil put it, because it's around the it's all about, in my view, how wrong we have got and still have got any concept, any understanding, any notion of what it means when we talk about behavior change. And one of the main reasons I'm really angry with myself is because I'm known as some kind of expert on travel behavior change. So in essence, I've perpetuated the myth that behavior change is some separate science, some separate set of understandings, some separate set of interventions that we need to understand and get right um, and out there uh, forever and still are people calling for more understanding of what changes behavior. This is utterly ridiculous. Behavior changes every day, every decade, every year. It has changed. We know how to change behavior. It is not a matter of separating pricing from behavior change intervention, regulation from behavior change intervention, technology from behavior change interventions. They are all behavior change interventions. They are how behavior changes. There is no separate art. There, and, and the idea that we, uh, we, we start to reduce behavior change to something that emanates from individuals uh, who have power to change when all the time, let alone the fact we're in, a, in an era now where we have to have the scale of change to achieve uh, that we now do, uh, that, that, that the individuals have any kind of real, real control over the, these, these big um, changes that, that, that have to be made is utterly obscene. Um, so the title of this webinar, is to uh what is it again encourage people to make lower carbon choices it's not a dark art it's not some taboo it's not a matter of uh, reducing people into those with the right set of information and knowledge and attitudes and those that haven't the good people who are behaving properly and the bad people who aren't behaving properly it doesn't matter well, it does matter, but very important that people understand climate change, that they are concerned about it. But that in itself is only helpful in that it, it will allow politicians to get on board with the idea that there can be some public acceptability. But whilst the government is saying that, that behaviour hasn't got to change, we can carry on as normal, um, this is actually I think, as Greg Archer said, going to inflame public opinion. It's going to confuse public opinion. Confusion is actually, as Glenn said, actually in the webinar on Monday, um, the, the intention of many decision makers is actually in their favor in, in many respects. One of the, uh, a really important study uh, that has, has been brought together very recently, and I can circulate the paper, from some uh, eminent behavioural scientists in the field of what, what's called pro-environmental behaviour, so not, not just mobility behaviour, has done an absolutely fabulous meta-analysis of many, many types of uh, research to understand what changes behaviour. And they have really just concluded what we've known from all these individual studies and yet seems to be completely ignored when we talk about behavior um, as though we've got to inform people and change attitudes that the main obstacle to behavior change is when people do not believe that their individual behavior will make a difference 
I am really, really upset at the moment when I'm hearing people say that out of the pandemic, people are ready for change. They're ready for radical change. They're going to continue the little bits of change that they've, they've undertaken around their mobility behaviours during the pandemic. The way it happened during the pandemic was that the government had a crisis mentality. It implemented legislation that we all had to comply to. People believed that with a, a few exceptions, everyone was going to have to do the same. There were some compensatory measures for certain people involved uh, in having to do some of the, the largest uh, changes to behavior. None of these things were in place. And without that common ground, that urgency, that idea that there um, are interventions that will impact everybody equally, behavior will not change. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Um, point well made, clearly made. I was just, as you were speaking, trying to think of examples um, where emergency has caused behaviour change. You mentioned one, COVID is, as you said, within a matter of weeks, there was legislation, massive change of behaviour. I suppose the beginning of the Second World War would be one where lots of regulations were brought in quite quickly, um, which fundamentally changed the way people lived their lives. Are there others that, that, that the, you cite? The, the, one that, the one that springs to mind is 1970s oil crisis. Uh, particularly in the States, we had a reduction in speed limits. Uh, Phil mentioned speed limits, uh, certainly one, one, something we could implement quickly. As a result, the International Energy Agency actually published off the back of the 1970s oil crisis a report called Saving Oil in a Hurry, where it identified a whole set of, uh, of measures such as speed limits and others. Uh, working from home back then was one of them. Um, that could be implemented quickly should we have another oil crisis. Um, so, that, so there are some of those things, but the real key is, with it, with, you know, we can talk about what happens in the crisis, but we have to then, um, uh, and with climate change, we have to talk about implementing things that go, are going to sustain. And if you look at the government's decarbonisation plan for transport, there is one graph in there, it's very fuzzy, it has no data behind it, separate set of gripes, um, that suggests that the only way in which we even have a hope in transport, the transport sector, of getting anywhere near the 2030 and 2050 targets is if the behaviour change that happened last year in transport is sustained. And yet, even before they published the report, we know that, that behaviour has floated back up in many respects to peak pandemic levels. So it, it needs policy that stays, not just temporary. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so our next uh, speaker is um, Andy Eastlake, who is Chief Executive of Zena Par Zemo Partnership. Um, this, I think, Andy, was what we used to know as low CVP, isn't it? Uh, which is a not-for-profit independent partnership. Is that the correct description? Absolutely, Stephen, yes. Go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you very much to uh, Claire and the team uh, for, for giving me this platform. Um, I'm, I'm not angry, um, and I certainly don't want to be on the wrong side of Gillian when she's angry either. Um, so I absolutely concur with her in terms of some of the points around not treating this as a crisis. I think, uh, you know, even 10 years, we're talking about a 10 year, that in, in a lot of psyche isn't regarded as uh, the, the near term crisis uh, that uh, we saw with COVID. I'm actually encouraged. Um, I think uh, I, I've, I've been working in this space uh, probably a, a similar amount of time to, uh, to Gillian, uh, but I'm actually encouraged because I feel that there is more energy uh, and more appetite for change than we've potentially seen over that whole period. Uh, and certainly the level of activity uh, that we're, uh, we're finding in relation to government work uh, is uh, certainly uh, ramped up at the moment. Um, but I think, you know, that's not to say that uh, we've got this sorted by any means whatsoever. Uh, there is absolutely uh, a need to continue to focus. And I think I want to just pick up on probably four key aspects that I think are critical in trying to move us forward. Um, I think those are the metrics that we use. 
I think our approach and, and inertia in the systems, um, I think our approach to risk is, is probably a, a key problem. And I believe communications are a fundamental issue that we still need to uh, overcome. So just to touch on those very briefly, um, the metrics, I think, are a key piece of the problem. We've spoken about, uh, and actually in the original plan for a plan, the setting the challenge for decarbonisation of transport, uh, there was a specific mention in the forward about creating new metrics to help people understand the impact of their journeys and their behaviour. Uh, and actually looking at the transport decarbonisation plan itself, published in July, uh, those, the development of those metrics seems to have gone a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, absent, if you like. But I genuinely think that we need to get a much better handle on how we measure success. At the moment, the automotive industry measures success around the number of vehicles it makes and the profit it makes. Uh, the, the charge point industry around the number of charges that they put in and, and there's drive for metrics of high numbers of charges. But if those aren't being used, if those aren't actually delivering low carbon transport and miles with lower grams per kilometre impact, uh, we failed. And perhaps those metrics need to be, uh, need to be reviewed. I think that's also part of the problem between the silos between different government departments and their perhaps conflicting priorities. Business and industry, obviously success of industry, success of our automotive industry is a, a measure for the Bayes Department. Uh, the Department of Transport does have the responsibility for the carbon from the tailpipe of vehicles, but not the well to tank elements. That sits back in, uh, in, in Bayes, of course. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the air quality is actually a DEFRA responsibility. And some of the things that we do at the moment are, you know, the metrics that we use do conflict across those different departments. So I believe there's a, a real uh, uh, need, and we are seeing some of that with, with some of the joint uh, uh, stakeholder groups, the, 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 the JACU air quality joint between DEFRA and DFT, OZEV, which is a Bayes and DFT combination. Those are starting to break down those boundaries. Uh, but where we come to things like hydrogen, hydrogen strategy, there are certainly some conflicts between the different departments. Uh, and indeed, hydrogen, a great example of where the metrics may not yet be sophisticated enough. We measure the greenhouse gas impact, and we need to be really, really focused on that uh, in terms of tailpipe. But we're not looking at the energy consumption. And some of our work within Zemo is trying to change that narrative about looking at not only greenhouse gas, but also energy consumption. This is going to be an energy problem very much going forward. Um, the next point what I want to talk about is really inertia. I think we have inertia in our industry. Changing things overnight is really, really difficult. Changing an industry from making combustion cars to electric cars, changing a, uh, an energy industry from powering 99% of our vehicles with fossil fuels to powering them with low carbon or zero carbon solutions of those. Uh, and possibly one of the quickest uh, impacts we can make is actually decarbonizing the fuels uh, that we use. So to me, you know, an aggressive approach on decarbonizing the fuels in the existing fleet is actually one of the things that can make a near-term difference between now and 2030, uh, where, as Gillian absolutely well highlighted, you know, the, the, the electrification of the fleet is going to take longer than that. We're not going to be able to change that overnight uh, and replace the fleet that we've got uh, in that sort of period of time. So I think inertia, but there's also what I'll call behavioural inertia. Um, it is actually difficult. People do what they've done and carry on doing it unless they get a shock to the system. The pandemic was a shock to the system. Uh, evolution of behaviour is very natural. We evolve in terms of things, but, but the sort of impact of the crisis we face requires a step change uh, in behaviour. And that behavioural inertia is something we've really got to overcome. Uh, risk, I think, is a key problem. And, and I would like here to, to sort of, if you like, compare and contrast the approach that government take to risk of technology, where innovate, fund, uh, a range of different uh, innovations and technologies, and they regard success if some of those don't actually make it. Some of them we learn and, if you like, fail fast and learn quickly sort of approach. Now, that isn't the approach we take to policy development. The risk taking in policy development is very, very conservative, small c, uh, and perhaps we need to be more ambitious. Let's try some things out. They may not always work. Uh, they may uh, get some heckles up, but we've got to take more ambition and therefore more risk in the way that we approach policy taking and perhaps move faster, 
perhaps not with all of the answers in place. Uh, we've, we've had a series of announcements of targets and a series of announcements of consultations to develop the plans. And there's been a lot of discussion around, and, and Lord Deben on Monday mentioned that we, we, we uh, you know, uh, um, really welcome the targets that are being set, but where are the plans behind them? And those plans are being thought through and lots of head scratching and consultation. Uh, now that's not to say we shouldn't do some of that, but we've got to be far more agile about that process. And the last point I wanted to pick up on was really communications. I think the communications industry as a whole has to share a significant piece of uh, the challenge and, if you like, the blame. The, 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 the way that we are regurgitating uh, what in, within the electric vehicle industry, FUD, um, you know, really uh, sort of um, fa falsehoods and uncertainty and doubt, you know, promoting, uh, promoting all of these uh, old perspectives about what an electric vehicle is or isn't and how clean or green it is. Uh, Greg Archer had a, a very good blog recently uh, under the Green Alliance banner and, uh, you know, picking up on one of the, uh, the recent um, APPG reports, uh, which really captured uh, a certain amount of media attention, but, you know, up to my mind, really didn't help the debate and really undermined what we're trying to do. And I think the communications and the appetite for sensational headlines and clickbait I think is a key part of the problem and, and something that we should really try and address that will help us uh, convince people uh, and encourage the market and provide robust metrics, robust information that will move us forward. So I think it's those, those are some of the key areas that I think we really can help uh, and where government potentially can play a role in moving us forward uh, into the sort of changes we need to see in the near term. Thank you, Andy. Um, I, I'm told that the video is ready, but what I suggest is that we let this session continue to the end and then run the video after that. And uh, we should have a bit of time for general discussion after the video. So uh, can we continue with Anna Rothney, who is Principal Transport Planner from, at Mott McDonald, well known to us all as a company. They're a managing, management engineering and development consultancy. Anna. Anna. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to start by saying how happy I am to be here. And uh, whilst I'm not as esteemed as a lot of my colleagues on the call, um, I think it's so important to bring in some perspective from a, quite a different generation, I think. And um, I haven't heard the word generation come up much, actually, in any of the, the talks so far. And I think that as a, a relatively young person, I see that there's so much potential for preventing a lot of the behaviours that we're talking about needing to change in the future. And I find myself getting as angry probably as to Gillian levels, um, looking at a lot of my peers going through the process of almost falling into the trap of car dependency at this age where you're kind of making those sort of decisions as to whether you want to buy a car and kind of take that, that route or I'm probably more of an extreme case of very much trying to avoid owning a car. But my main frustration is things like fares act as such a big barrier for people who have very different motivations. So a lot of my peers are very motivated by money. You know, they want to find the cheapest option. And as Phil mentioned, pricing structures are kind of maintaining the car dependence. They make it seem as though owning a car is much less expensive than a lot of the alternatives that there are out there. Um, as you may be able to tell him from Scotland, uh, I have never been so happy in my life to see the announcement about the new Lumo service, which is a low cost alternative to flying between London and Edinburgh. Usually it would cost me hundreds of pounds to travel by train to Scotland. This is now like a super cheap alternative. And I'm now able to convince my peers to take that option rather than alternatives because it's cheaper and they're more likely to be, to be motivated by that. So I feel like fares really need to be enticing. They need to entice people into using alternatives and Rather than seeing that as making fares cheap as a subsidy, I feel like it's so much more of an investment in social, environmental and economic outcomes as well, because you're really opening up the kind of alternative travel options to wider audiences um, that, yeah, that have a various level of um, means, I guess. And I just want to touch finally on the fare side of things with mobility as a service. One of my pet peeves is when people kind of squash the concept of mass as being oh, newfangled or, you know, not going to work and things. I'm like, I need mobility as a service. Mobility as a service is how I travel. I don't own a vehicle. I need mobility as a service. The kind of more futuristic view of mass is kind of this um, overarching system that allows you to pay and everything, I think could really be successful if it offers 
good discounts and bundles that are really appealing to people as an alternative so they can see oh I don't have to rely I don't have to become dependent on the car because I have those alternative options and I can see that I'm saving money I'm, I'm getting discounts on e-scooters and whatever else um, I want to use and then I just wanted to touch on um, Claire mentioned road user charging earlier and for me like I really question what is the ultimate objective like I think that you can slap a tax on people but if it's not clear like why that tax is being slapped on them like I don't feel that message is really coming through clearly and I think I've looked into smoking as, as an example actually of where you know TV advertising ended long before taxes were introduced and when you look at then the declining levels you know there's a big decline then taxes came along and actually after taxes were introduced there was a small stagnation and decline which then picks up again after there's more active efforts to communicate more of the point which is about health risks and about you know why we're why that tax was slapped in the first place and i think that yeah there's so many things that can accompany something like tax to make people realize and understand and become less hostile because they understand the point they understand why that tax is there and what it's trying to achieve and i feel like without that messaging people won't really respond well to a tax for example so i think that's the main point i wanted to pick up on Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Anna. You, you're a, an inspiration. Um, somebody really understands. But how do you deal with the point that I think Gillian Annabel made, that um, we, we have difficulty when people don't feel their own behaviour will make a difference to anything. And we're dealing with a general public who are much less sophisticated than you are, and are, are generally speaking, not quantitative. They don't understand numbers. Mm. You know, we all talk about the magnitudes and the crisis and so on. They just don't know what it means when you talk about uh, the measurements and the numbers and so on. Do you think that, that, that the world can only continue? Mm, yeah, I mean, for me, it was doing a, a carbon footprint calculator, I don't know if anyone else has, and you really see the impact of transport. Like, flying in cars are the most impactful things you can do. Like if yeah, these these sort of things. And that for me was a big wake up moment of being like, oh, that's actually such a big thing. I go on about it all the time, but it really is. And yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I find it frustrating. Yeah. I mean, how many of your generation would have the faintest idea what a carbon input calculator would mean or care about it? Yeah, I think there's a, there's definitely, I mean, we're in an echo chamber, aren't we, of privilege of people in well-paid jobs. Uh, we're all white on this call, I've noticed, you know, like it, there's, there's people that are frozen out from this kind of conversation. I think that's a massive problem and we need to understand different people and how to communicate with different people. Thank you. Uh, we must move on uh, to Anthony Smith, well known to us all as Chief Executive of Transport Focus. Anthony. Stephen, thank you very much indeed. And good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Fantastic debate so far. I hope we can harness some of this energy, anger and other emotions. We've got to fuel quite a few buildings on the basis of this, if nothing else. It's really good. Um, hot news from the front line. Um, I was walking, doing my morning walk this morning and the schools are going back. And of course, the traffic is clogged again. People are driving their kids to school. My load, the junction near my house, there's been a scheme there for the last 20 odd years to try and free it up to unclog it to get the buses flowing more smoothly for it. Absolutely stuck in planning and politics. And I think it just underlines the local nature of a lot of this debate, how it actually affects people and just how difficult it is to achieve some changes locally. Um, transport Focus, some of you will know us, we're the independent consumer watchdog for Britain's transport users. We're very much a consumer organisation, we're very much trying to be useful to all of you who are making decisions, trying to drive change in these areas, and above all else, use evidence. And what I want to contribute to this debate is to argue to be much more bottom up, much more consumerist in how we're approaching this, and help people really choose more sustainable forms of transport. A lot of this debate it's very top down. Things are being done to people. Um, you may know that the Green Party in Germany is nicknamed the No Party because they like telling people what they can't do. And I just think we have to recognise the political realities of some of these changes. No matter what the actual crisis actually is, there is politics. And a lot of what we've talked about is government investing more at the same time as its revenue from cars and vehicles coming down at the same time. Very tricky political balance. And also, I think we just mustn't kid ourselves. If I'm asked in a survey, one of my own surveys, you know, do I want to 
save the planet. Of course I'm going to say I want to save the planet. Do I want to pay 10 quid to drive the kids to school if that was what I did? Mm, maybe not. I think what people say and what people do can often be two very different things. We've just got to help people on this journey. Um, we've just published a bit of insight, which I'll pop into the chat function, looking at people's attitudes post-COVID to sustainability to, um, and to transport. It's very interesting. It's very sobering. Um, a lot of people are completely at a loss about what else they could do to help save the planet. They do their recycling, but it's not clear what else they can do. This stuff is very tribal. It's got a lot of identity politics involved in it. People don't like being labelled as green, even though they're actually doing some quite green things. And people say, well, hang on, there's, everyone's still flying. There's power stations in China. What's the point of doing all this? This is, this is silly. You know, me cycling to the supermarket is not going to make any difference. I think reinforcing what Stephen just said. And I think that balance of getting it right for consumers about the cost and the convenience, which is how we all choose how to travel, getting that balance right and tilting that balance to help people choose more, more sustainable transport is really important. Ultimately, long, long, long term, as Stephen said, planning will help. But at the moment, the, um, the car is, is convenient and cost effective for many people. And of course, as electric vehicles appear, some of the guilt disappears as well because there's no pollution coming out of the exhaust pipe. Now, what are we going to do? I'm optimistic. I share what other speakers have said. There's no point being pessimistic. We've got to be optimistic. The transport decarbonisation plan, of course, it didn't save the planet on its own, but it's a good start. It's a good place for government to be. Underneath it, you've got the bus strategy, you've got the rail reform, you've got the electric vehicle drive. These are all good things. But public transport is under great pressure. Post-COVID, revenues down, ridership down. The climate is actually affecting the railways. The railways get washed away quite regularly. They're quite fragile infrastructure in that respect which will only put up the cost of maintaining them so public transport has a role to play but i don't think it's going to be total solution to any of this and of course decarbonization as other speakers have said in a way it's the easy bit it's the behavior change that underpins it that's really tricky so yes Let's keep pushing people, helping people choose active transport. Let's keep investing in making public transport better and the better choice. Let's grab people when they move houses, that critical point in your life when you can really change how you need to travel. And let's keep pushing on electric vehicles. But let's face facts. Cars are great. That's why most people have got them. I suspect most people who are on this call either own a car or use a car. There's very good reasons for this. And I think we just have to be realistic about that and take people with us on this journey. And I think what our research showed when we did it is that after a century of building our societies around car use, people are literally, they can't imagine living without cars. They just can't see how they could do it. This is going to be quite a difficult, long journey. And I think, as with other speakers have said, ultimately, you can't perhaps really see how this is going to be cracked in the shorter term without some compulsion, without some road pricing, some tax, tax issues, which will actually make people think about the choices that they're making. And finally, just one real plea. Can we stop using this phrase, mass? I have got no idea what it means. I don't think it goes down well in the pub. I, I, I wish we could just ban it today and turn it into plain English. So my argument is go consumer, go bottom up. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Anthony. But I didn't catch the phrase. The, what's the phrase you want us to stop using? Mass mobility as a service. I ah. don't think. I don't think outside of our little groups, it means absolutely anything. Yeah, I entirely agree. It's gobbledygook. Yes, indeed. Um, thank you. So uh, next we have Paul Campion, who is chief executive of. Um, the research consultancy, um, TRL, uh, once upon a time that was a government research station, went independent uh, and now continues as a, an independent um, consultancy body. Paul? It does indeed. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I'm uh, uh, going to have to have a word with the organisers because I'm, uh, I'm after everyone has said all these in important uh, stirring, interesting, detailed, well-informed things. What on earth can I say? And even worse than that, I'm in front of uh, Hugh Merriman. So um, 
just a couple of observations then, perhaps to reflect, as I'm sure everyone is, on what we've heard. Um, first off, just to pick up the point that Anna made uh, around generations. Uh, my experience, limited as it is, uh, but with my children, with the graduates and apprentices we employ um, as I read, watch, listen to what's going on around me, is that the uh, younger generation get this to a much greater extent than uh, older generations uh, like mine do, and are much more flexible. Uh, after they've got much more skin in the game. So uh, if there's any portion of the population that is better informed and cares more about this, it's the young. Uh, and I take great heart from that, by the way. Um, not to say we are where we need to be, but, um, uh, but I, you know, I don't see that the young are less well-informed or care less about this, quite the opposite. Uh, we're talking about yeah. government. Government can do four things, can't it? It can tax, it can spend, it can regulate, and it can lead. Now, one of the problems with leading in your fear in government is that uh, people learn quite early on that they can only lead as fast as people are willing to follow. And you may remember the fuel tax duty revolt, if I can use that word, of uh, 2010, there or thereabouts, when um, it was a uh, Labour government, I think at the time wasn't it, but it doesn't really matter, was essentially held to ransom by, uh, by truck drivers angry at the cost of fuel duty. Um, interesting that fuel is a lot more expensive now than it was then, um, although maybe not so much in relative terms. That experience is still referred to inside central government when they think about how fast they can drive uh, uh, behavioural change with regulation. And there is um, a nervousness at trying to go too fast, at trying to force the pace too much. And that's one and the same time wise and limiting. Because limiting, not just because, as everyone has pointed out, we have a genuine crisis on our hands. We have non-negotiable timelines here and we can't wait for everyone to get a clue. We've got to do something but also limiting because it probably underrates the extent to which uh, a different articulation, I'm going to go back to what I always say, a different story, a different way of talking about this could motivate people. I, I was very taken by the phrase political suicide. Uh, you, you know, it, it's, th this is the political version of perhaps the official's view of how fast you can drive it, which is, well, you know, I can never sell this policy. Um, and it's interesting to me that it's much easier always to talk, as we are doing now at the end of the pandemic, about going back to normal, because it feels somehow comforting. It feels as if you know, one is doing, a, doing one's job. We've got the crisis out of the way. Now we're back to normal. But that any examination of whether that normal was actually good, uh, and I, for one, think that normal could be dramatically improved, not least in the ways that make Gillian. Uh, quite rightly angry. Um, and there are lots of degrees of freedom here. It's interesting uh, when we think about what political will is, you know, you get into some really deep water here about what does democracy mean. You know, I, I find it interesting that the National Infrastructure um, Plan, the NPS, which was put in place um, uh, for transport as a result of Planning Act 2008, has been challenged in the courts, uh, not through politics as usual. And so, you know, we're seeing some interesting ways in which the machine is operating uh, in interesting times. Look, I suppose what, what I'm thinking of finally is, is the metaphor of the body politic, the idea that the government is the head and it somehow uh, controls all the limbs of the state and therefore the citizens is probably radically out of date and unhelpful here. And, you know, I think it's been quite pervasive in the way we've been talking about it. We've talked about behavioural change uh, very much as a what can government do to help people to do the right thing. Uh, and we can unpack that at length, by the way. Uh, and I have some views as to how far we're going to get by explain to people what the right thing is, because I think a lot of people feel, and probably correctly, they don't have the luxury to do the right thing. They have to do what is necessary to get through the week. 
But anyway, I think the metaphor is wrong. I don't think we should be thinking human body. I don't think we should be thinking head and limbs. I think we should be thinking of an octopus whose intelligence is distributed through its entire limbs. And when we talk about behavior change, surely what we've mostly been talking about here is how do we get politicians and officials to change their behavior? I think that's not only poorly studied, but it's little thought about. The behavior of a transport planner in one of the more than 200 local authorities with road building authority in this, in this country is dictated entirely by their budget, uh, the, 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 um, the pressures on their time. Oh, and by the way, their training, he, and it almost certainly is a he, probably got trained 30 years ago, doesn't hasn't ever had the education or the training to understand the new possibilities to, to think. What are we doing to help that person change their behavior, to help, to, to help the local people to deliver better outcomes? What are we doing about understanding the behavior of the politicians and the civil servants in central government and understanding why they aren't behaving in the way that we want to in turn change the behavior of the citizen? Well, big question, I don't have an answer. If I did, um, I'd probably be rich enough to be on a beach instead. But look, I, I think, as always, fascinating uh, uh, debate. Um, really, really enjoyed it, find it inspiring, find it refreshing, and, uh, and I feel optimistic that there are so many people who care as passionately and are full of such great ideas. And I think, uh, uh, you know, I'm therefore confident that we will get this done somehow. But I think we need to be very clear about what our outcome is start with the end in mind, and then work back to understand who has to do what to whom to get there. So behaviour of change, yes, absolutely for citizens, but behaviour change for government, local and central as well. Stephen, that's, uh, that's the best I can come up with after such uh, an, an impressive set of people to follow. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we have one final speaker, um, which is Professor Glenn Lyons. Uh, after which we will run the video from uh, Hugh Merriman. So, uh, Glenn, Professor um, of Future Mobility, Mott Mac McDonald Professor at the University of Western England. Glenn. Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, well, I'm sure like most of you now on the call, um, your brain is fizzing uh, with a myriad of thoughts. I know my blood pressure is up. Um, and as Anne has reminded us, what a privilege to be spending our morning as knowledge workers in this stimulating intellectual discussion. Um, but it is another bubble, isn't it? Um, and I know that it won't be long after I leave this call that I'll see some other reminders of the stark crisis that we're in, in terms of climate change. Uh, and that in turn will exacerbate what Gillian pointed out as a condition, which I now realize I have, um, which is pre-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, when it comes to climate change. Um, but I'd like to try and kind of make my contribution by trying to tell one of Paul Campion's stories, as he quite rightly emphasises the importance of storytelling, through this myriad of, um, of thoughts and ideas and recommendations that we've heard this morning. Um, and I'll start by a point you made, Stephen, which is we've been saying all of this for the last 20 to 30 years in different shapes and forms and, and points of emphasis. So surely our starting question has to be, what's new that really is going to bring about something different this time in the time that we've got? Um, well, Andy suggested it might be that we do have more energy and appetite, whether, whether we means us in this call or the, the population at large, I'm not sure. Um, is Code Red going to be the what's new that makes the difference? Well, presumably only if there's really serious public concern for Code Red. And Thank goodness there seem to be signs that that concern is growing, um, especially perhaps amongst the young. Um, but what follows, I think, most importantly, uh, in terms of what's new, is public action. And I don't mean action in terms of travel behaviour change, which may be important uh, ultimately, but public action in terms of trying to change the system. And of course, last month, we saw many brave souls, as far as I'm concerned, appear in London with Extinction Rebellion, the impossible rebellion. And it certainly feels impossible listening to the uh, ideas in this call. But also, perhaps more down to earth, if you like, Kate Pangborn in, in the audience very early on in this session um, made a plea for us to 
recognise and give more attention to the importance of community action groups. Uh, and I think this touches upon uh, what Paul was emphasising, that this is a different type of behaviour change. Community action groups, and I won't pretend to have direct involvement and realise that I perhaps should, um, which will include more and more young people, I suspect, are ultimately about understanding the system they occupy, but trying to work with and influence the local politicians. And it's only by influencing the politicians that we can change the system. And the poor politicians have got to fight with the behaviour of corporates um, who also need to change their behaviour. And only through system change will we get behaviour change. So how do you change the system? Well, I think those community action groups are very important. And imagine if we could multiply them at the speed Phil refers to. Um, but Stephen, your excellent blog this week um, was titled, It's Time to Put a Price on Carbon. And in that you said, there's a direct approach and one that is simple for everyone to understand. If the problem is the release of CO2, then price carbon properly. And I found that very compelling because of the word simple. Uh, and indeed, if I heard correctly, Phil earlier today said, tax carbon, it's easy. Um, I'm not convinced, I have to say, that the word simple or easy, even for um, pricing carbon, are going to deliver much in the next 10 years. But my goodness, let's hope they do. Um, but the point is, if you're pricing carbon, um, you need to have alternatives uh, available in terms of how people are living their lives. And those alternatives may include technologically based solutions, but we need alternatives if people are going to change behaviour. That's, that's what determines their choice set. Uh, but what we seem to have forgotten time and time again in this call, and I accept the Gillian reminding us, is Phil's salutary point about immediacy, uh, indeed one that Claire made at the start. It's the next 10 years or less that matter. And how much of what you've heard this morning is really anything more than the same old thing we've heard from the last 20 to 30 years. And for me, the sense of immediacy, the really the new thing is back to Kate Pangborn's point about community action. And that may be community in a village, in a town or city. It could be nationwide or global action as we're seeing with Extinction Rebellion. But I think that's where behavior change could be most powerful. It's using our voices as citizens. And those voices include us as professionals. And here's an admission at the end. I ask myself, whilst I'm in these conversations quite regularly, have I ever tried or indeed dared to speak to perhaps 10 people in my immediate local community, including people I don't particularly know well? And the answer is I haven't. And I'd throw that challenge to all of you in this call. How many of you, with perhaps the exception of Kate and I'm, sh I'm sure Gillian, um, have really dared to ask the people beyond the bubble what they're thinking um, in order that we can help influence them and perhaps become part of community action? Uh, and I would be very pleased to have some help and support, I have to say, within our sector when we're talking about um, policy solutions. If you like a professional policy, how do we mobilise the great wealth of knowledge that we have as transport professionals to support those community action groups? Uh, and perhaps I'll finish by a salute to Steve Melia, who for the second time in about 18 months has been arrested um, in his standing up as part of community action for what he believes in and the change he realises has to happen in the next 10 years. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Glenn. Um, in just a moment, um, I'll invite the organisers organizers to run Hugh Merriman's film, but I just wanted to clarify a point with Gillian, if she's still on the line. Are you there, Gillian? I am, yes. Um, Gillian, everybody's been impressed by what you said and picking up the point about the urgency, including Glenn just now. Um, there was a, an argument, a line, a couple of years ago. You see it with the Committee on Climate Change. Uh, you see it with the Bayes document, which said that if we follow a particular path, we can get from here to there uh, within the horizons we need to do it at a relatively low cost. And I think Lord, Lord Deben mentioned that uh, figure in his talk on Monday. Um, so my question to you is, do you buy that argument? And if you do, I guess your point is, 
we're just not getting on with we've already lost two years i think you said and obviously the more years we lose the more gruesome it gets uh, and in fact we lose the opportunity to take the sensible path from here to there and have to do something uh, really terrible w would that be a fair summary of your position it is i think i'm right saying somebody might correct me that lord deben also said or somebody else said on monday that whilst o the overall costs may not be large uh, they won't be evenly spread. Um, so there will be some costs incurred uh, that, that may be a bit unpalatable by some. Um, and certainly when you look at the distribution of who is who are the highest emitters, um, uh, it is very unevenly spread. Um, you know, the, 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 the wealthy are consuming more, um, but then they can also afford to do a lot more uh, mitigation options themselves. So I think there are ways of um, of making it fair, um, but um, it can't. So, so that's one point. The other point about urgency, though, is that, um, as I think Anthony said, and Phil and I have recently written um, a blog called "The Two Two Futures" that makes this point: the longer we leave it, the more we fail. Uh, the higher the costs of adaptation are going to be, and we're already starting to see those. So that means that regardless of whether you're talking about spending on mitigation now to succeed or allowing failure to happen, um, and either way, it's going to cost money. And actually, either way, we're talking about disruptions and reductions to, to travel demand. So both futures involve travel demand and costs. And indeed, the future where we fail to do anything will also have um, distribution, distributional effects as well. So we have to just look at the whole picture. Yeah, thank you. Um, so can we move on now to the keynote speech from Hugh Mer Merriman? Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be with the Greener Transport Solutions uh, audience. Uh, I'm really delighted to take part in the subject rising to the challenge. What will it take to decarbonize transport? I'm not quite live. Uh, because it's transport oral questions in the chamber today. So um, I have to be in there to ask that question, but I'm doing this 45 minutes beforehand. So the same shirt and tie will be on in the chamber. Um, let me just start by saying I really applaud all of the efforts that the entire community makes uh, to look to decarbonize transport. It will require all of us to come up with the ideas, the initiatives, and then uh, to take the public with us. And I want to talk a bit about what the Transport Select Committee is doing, uh, will be doing, uh, as far as this agenda is concerned, and also how we can better engage with the public. So I'm sorry if there'll be some shameless plugs uh, of the Transport Select Committee work, but hopefully that's what you want to hear for. And of course, transport accounts for the largest source of carbon dioxide emissions of any sector in the UK. So moving to low carbon solutions for travel has got to be part of the UK's path to meeting its legally binding target of net zero emissions by 2050. And when I came in as Transport Select Committee Chair and was elected by the other 649 MPs, my pledge was that every single inquiry we hold will incorporate this challenge and underpin everything we ask, everything we scrutinise. Because surface transport provides 70% of all transport emissions. And so there's great scope to actually try and work out how we can not just change the way our surface transport uh, is produced, but also reduce it as well in terms of modal shift. Now, the government's ban on the sale of all new petrol and diesel cars and vans by 2030 presents uh, this kind of opportunity, but also great challenges. So we've just held an inquiry into zero emission vehicles, and we'll shortly go on to its sister inquiry, which will be road pricing. We've asked what actions are required from government, local authorities, and the private sector to increase the production and take up and deliver the infrastructure required to deliver an electric car market. Let's be quite clear, we need to see a curve between now and 2030. We're not on the right trajectory, and so more needs to be done. As part of that, in terms of engaging with the public, we put questions direct to drivers. And I think that the research has showed that most registrations on new battery vehicles in 2020 were made by commercial fleets, not private consumers. Our survey was asking what influences the decision uh, to buy or not buy uh, an electric vehicle and the response seemed to be range anxiety uh, price uh, and also the inability to be able to charge 
Um, so those are all matters we've looked at. We've proposed a, what we call a ZEV mandate, where effectively those producers of electric vehicles um, who produce the most would be able to sell credits to those uh, motor manufacturers who produce the least. So effectively that acts as a subsidy, which we then would like to see as a reduction in the price of an electric vehicle and ultimately incentivizes the entire motor manufacturing industry towards producing electric. We've also suggested uh, that the national grid needs to be mapped out so we can see where are the spots where if people start charging vehicles, it will just down the grid uh, in their area. Um, and also the price disparity of charging from home versus charging on the street. Why is it that it's 20% VAT charged for those on the street, of which that's 30% of householders, whereas those householders that have a drive get just 5% uh, of uh, VAT. And again, you tend to find that those with the houses perhaps tend to have more money. So all of these ideas we put in our paper, and I very much hope you'll engage with it. Now, of course, the reason we're looking at road pricing is hand in hand is because the resulting shortfall in tax revenue is going to create a headache for the Chancellor, who stands to lose around 40 billion uh, annually from fuel and excise duty, which, of course, don't apply to electric as things stand. So it could be said that road pricing could not only plug that hole, but could also bring in some form of pricing mechanism to genuinely change behaviour and lead to uh, a reduction in congestion, in air pollution and the overall carbon footprint. Uh, we're going to examine further this autumn, but this theme is how does price change behaviour? Can we incentivise people by price to travel at different times of the day, perhaps when there's less uh, traffic on there? And can we also use price to show, well, this is how much it will travel, cost to travel by car from uh, London to Newcastle. This is how much it costs in terms of rail. Is it cheaper to go by rail? So really consumers can directly compare pricing. And then when it comes to the infrastructure, obviously transport is about half of the budget of infrastructure spend that the government uh, has slated. Now that can be a major contributor to emissions or if it's spent well, that can actually help us reduce our carbon footprint. Now the government has changed the spending rules to ensure that projects which deliver a net zero uh, element are as valid as those deliver the best bang for the buck. But of course, ensuring the delivery of both um, is absolutely key. And what we don't want to have is that there are projects which are you know, look very worthy, but actually they'll have very little uh, delivery in terms of uh, the green agenda, and they could become uh, what one would say a green white elephant. So our inquiry wants to look at how these projects are appraised, how they'll be delivered, and ultimately to ensure that they still deliver value for money as well as delivering towards net zero. So as the Treasury model changes from just how much am I going to get back from this investment to what does this do towards net zero? What does it do to regeneration? Um, it's important that that's properly modelled and looked at. And there's a whole scope of other um, re uh, recommendations in our transport infrastructure inquiry uh, findings, which will come out probably later this month. Uh, don't want to miss out rail. Travelling by rail has environmental advantages, but then most of the network is, of course, still diesel. The government aims to decarbonise by 2040. And our report on trains fit for the future recommends that we crack on with electrification, but keep an eye out for the benefits of hydrogen battery should their credentials be developed. Now, just in terms of what the government has done uh, in decarbonising transport, we're obviously there to focus and scrutinise where things could be done better to get behind innovations uh, and new technology. Let's look and see what they've done well. They've set some important key goals, such as ending uh, the ending of sales of the combustion engine and the decarbonisation decarbonization of rail, uh, and it could be argued that these big bang expiry dates are needed to drive new markets and set the clock running, but behind there we need policy uh, and drive to underpin it. The government of course is seeking for people to use their cars less and for walking, cycling and public transport to become people's natural first choices for many day-to-day -day journeys, and as a result the government has set a target for half of all journeys in towns and cities to be walked or cycled by 2030. That's very ambitious. Uh, welcome it, uh, but the key now is making sure we have the investment uh, and the sell uh, of these alternative uh, transport methods to ensure that people really take them up. Uh, as far as um, the government is concerned with regards to bus services, of course we talk a lot about rail, but we must remember that more people use bus uh, than any other form of public transport. Um, the government has got behind the Transport Select Committee's call for a bus strategy, 
previous government rejected it. We finally got there, which is very exciting for us. Um, our committee looked at buses and reported a bleak painted picture, really, of steady decline, uncoordinated services, fragmented government policy, and we called for one single unified approach and for real investment in local transport authorities. So in March, the government delivered a national strategy heralding funding for cheaper, greener bus services and partnerships between local authorities and operators to improve services, looking at London uh, as really the kite mark. Now, the issue for us, though, is that local transport authorities who are either short on staff or enthusiasm for buses need more expertise uh, to be able to really come up with a policy uh, that they can then bid off the back of with government funding. And I think at the moment, the jury is out as to some local transport authorities who just seem to think management consultants are the answer rather than engaging with the public and coming up with really exciting, innovative opportunities that fit the geography that they represent. And I really would call for local uh, government to really get behind the bus strategy because if you don't bid in an ambitious manner you won't get the funding which actually helps green bus services. I'll also make a nod to e-scooters, they come up an awful lot. I think they're an exciting example of new technology which have the potential to be a low cost, accessible and environmentally friendly alternative to the private car. Studies in the States from one particular city uh, demonstrated that 30% of journeys that would have otherwise been used by car were being used by e-scooters. The committee has supported a private and a rental market, but we do need a delivery of technology to ensure that e-scooters cannot be used on pedestrian paths. The industry has talked about geofencing uh, as a measure, but it doesn't seem to work at the moment. And I think we really have to push the industry to make it safer for pedestrians, uh, as well as uh, getting behind this new form of technology that gets people out of the car. I'll just make a mention to what I see as the greatest challenge for decarbonising transport on the path to net zero. Really, I think it's having the political will to follow through on all of this, to persuade the elector, the consumer, to move away from the tried and trusted and get them to switch to different forms of transport. And that's why I believe a pricing mechanism will deliver uh, that type of change. But let's be honest, it won't deliver financial savings for everyone. For some, it will actually cost more. But if we are serious about delivering net zero, as well as reducing obesity, then we need to not only switch from combustion to electric, but also from car to other modes of transport. It's all well and good hailing green uh, in, in, in the form of electric uh, as the green alternative, uh, but look deeper and it can be seen that only 40% of electricity comes from renewables. It's still a dirty enterprise on the whole, which takes a lot out of the planet. As an example, rail already accounts for 1% of the national grid, and that's even before we ramp up electrification as part of the government's decarbonisation policy on rail. So I believe price can play an important mechanism in reducing the carbon footprint. The UK can provide a model for the rest of the globe and sell this when it comes to COP26. When it comes to road pricing, the key global, global example that we've seen and been referred to by the market is in fact on our doorstep in London. Yet the congestion zone charges car users in London the same price for driving one mile into the zone as those who drive across it and belch out pollution for hours in a day. The introduction of 5p uh, plastic bags demonstrates that when you use price as a unit on an item, then consumers end up reducing the unit spent and therefore their overall consumption. That's got to be good for the planet. It's got to be good for transport. Successive governments have shied away from these challenges. This government has a combination of ambitious targets, support from the public for net zero delivery and a taxation black hole, which is going to have to fill. So I would ask if we don't do it now, with all of this backing behind us, then we never will. And I think transport can play a real lead. And I'll thank you all again for the focus you give to it. And I really hope that you'll follow our inquiries, get behind them with the evidence that you can de deliver to us, the new ideas, the new technology that you may have seen uh, or championed, uh, and bring it to us so that we can try and scrutinize it and sell better policies and do our bit to make the planet greener. I wish you a good uh, rest of your day. Uh, and the weekend to come. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I'm really sorry that uh, Hugh Merriman can't be here to engage with the discussion, um, particularly of his remarks. Um, it's, all, it's, it's all good stuff, isn't it? It's, good, it's really good to hear the chair of the select committee uh, speaking in those terms, but as we've said earlier, it's all so old. I mean, he, the stuff he said about road pricing, which I agree with, was said by Smead in 1964. 
Um, I, I would like, in what time remains, to really um, develop this thinking about what we can do to make government, both central government and, and local government, recognize the point about urgency. Um, to Gillian's point that we're wasting so much time that the kind of recipes which Hugh Merriman was just talking about, good though they are, simply have no chance of uh, solving the problem um, in the time that we have available. I mean, it seems to me we have a really fundamental constitutional problem. The politicians have to get the support of the general public, the electorate. Um, the electorate is so far behind the ball that they aren't going to get that in time. So how do we get sufficient action taken uh, in the time that we have available? Anyway, look, um, Phil, you've had your hand up. Uh, let's hear from you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Stephen. I wanted to comment on this recurrent theme, and uh, you've now mentioned it uh, again, of what we actually do to make government and everybody else take this seriously. And it relates to the issue of the reasons for not taking it seriously, which are it's too expensive, it's unnecessary, it's too disruptive, and it's inequitable. And all those things, excuses for not doing things, disappear in the face of one question, which is, it's not expensive, it's not disruptive, it's not inequitable, by comparison with the only alternative future which is on offer to us, which is runaway climate change. And that is the way that it has to be presented we either have the choice of a disruptive, catastrophic effect on transport geography, on uh, economic viability and on social existence, or we have the choice of doing these things. And by that comp comparison, it's not expensive. It's the cheaper option is to do these things. That recognition, I think, changes the terms of the debate. Not having that recognition makes the debate impossible to, to win. Thank you, Phil. Um, and I think that point was made by Lord Deben on Monday. It was made some years ago by Nick Stern when he did his, his, his work on this thing, um, that if we act quickly, there is, there's a way of doing it at reasonable cost, if, if I understand your... your uh, um, your point. Um, but but we aren't winning through, are we? we? I think we're all agreed the action is not happening uh, to put us on that on that path and it shows no sign of happening. Anthony, Anthony Smith. Thank you. I think this point about the immediacy of the crisis and its kind of salience is really, really important. Um, COVID, if you went out, you could catch a fatal disease. It's pretty, pretty, you know, that's pretty in your face. The Second World War, we were being bombed. You did something about it. The people driving their kids again to school this morning, I don't think there's thinking in their heads there's the slightest link between their actions and what is happening to the climate. And I think how I'd be really interested to hear what panelists and participants think about how on earth you try and make a slightly better connection between the two things, because at the moment it seems like a very distant connection. Glenn, I agree. Glenn. Um, yeah, I, I guess I, in, in terms of trying to make the glass feel a bit, a bit more half, half full, Stephen, um, I'm reminded of the old adage that, um, things in the short term happen slower than you hoped they would uh, and in the longer term happen faster than you can ever imagine they could. Um, if I look back personally three years ago, um, I wasn't anywhere like as, as mobilised and consumed by, yes, I was consumed by sustainable transport, but not by tackling this enormous crisis. And then along came a young teenager um, in Sweden uh, and that that was the light bulb for me. And, and of course, pre-COVID, that was a light bulb 
for literally millions of particularly young people around the world. It's intriguing how the pandemic in some ways switched that light bulb off in some senses because of the issue of, of mass crowds and protests. But I, I do wonder when, if that's the amount of change we've seen in the last three years with, with parts of the public expressing concern very visibly, if we move forward two more years, three more years, and I know that's three years into a desperately short decade, um, whether we will be looking back today and thinking, my goodness, we, we didn't know the half of it in terms of the expression of concern that's emanating out, not just from many, many scientists who are on the streets because they've given up on science alone being able to persuade politicians. So I take some confidence from that, and I just come back to the point that I think we need to be looking at how we can help um, public expression of concern rather than perhaps so much effort on how we change travel behavior directly. Thank you, Lynn. Anna? Hello. Um, I just wanted to um, firstly pick up on a point that I think Anthony made earlier about the car being great. I agree that the car is an invention that's obviously succeeded and because it's convenient. But there's so many people that are frozen out from using the car. I think about 50% of the population has a car, a driving license. If you think about all the young people that can't drive, elderly people who can no longer drive, people with disabilities. And um, when I was writing my, my blog piece, um, I was looking at um, diversity as well. And, and, and white people are much more likely to have um, access to a car than um, other ethnic groups. And yeah, I just think I just wanted to pick up on a point that cars are great for people that have them, for people that don't have them. Cars most certainly are not great and they're a massive pain. <laughs> um, I think I could easily see that as a young person living in a city without a car, that they're, yeah, I find them a massive pain. Um, but yeah, so um, I also just wanted to pick up on the point about like the behaviour change that, I mean, we have 32 million cars in the UK. Uh, there's one for every two people. Like, Sometimes it feels like an elephant in the room is actually just saying we need to reduce that. And I don't think, I don't know if I hear many people really, we talk about alternatives, we talk about getting more people to walk and cycle, we talk about getting people to use public transport, but we all know as transport planners, the biggest barrier to that is car ownership. If people own a car, they're more likely to jump in it than take an alternative. Like that's, it just seems to be a plain fact. So I'm keen to hear what other people think, if we need to be more direct and more open about that challenge, about getting, encouraging people in the same way that veganisms vegans encourage people to go vegan which is an extreme form of of a behavior change but it influences and and inspires so many people to make more gradual choices to because they understand the purpose of of the movement of the extreme movement um so yeah keen to hear what others think but you've identified a central problem that um people who have cars spend a vast amount on them because they're enormously valuable to them. Mm -hmm. And if between us we are proposing taking that away from them, there's going to have to be a very strong politically acceptable, generally acceptable argument to allow that to happen. Um, I think Paul Campion had his hand up next. Thanks, and, Steve. And then Gillian and then Suzanne. Thanks, Stephen. And I'd like to, I think, build on what uh, Glenn, Aaron, you've just said, uh, Stephen. Um, I think there's a danger in thinking that there's one big thing here that we've got to do. We've got to get everyone to realise it's urgent and then suddenly the problem solved. I think we've got to do a lot of relatively smaller things. It's really, it's Anna's point, which there are, uh, you know, there's a, there's a huge diversity of uh, types of transport consumption, of lifestyles, of, and by the way, of issues. And Stephen, to your point, I think it, you know, we're never going to succeed in telling people, here's a great idea, let me take your car away. We have to find ways for them to do the things they need to do to flourish and live sustainable lives that are better, that are more desirable for whatever reason. Now, that could involve some, uh, uh, some sticks as well as carrots. I mean, we might, want to, we might all believe that tax on, on fuel could go up. Uh, more rapidly than the cost of public transport, for instance. That's one signal. What it does is it changes people's propensities, but it's part of a bigger story. Let me just take, take one example we didn't mention before. I, there is a one big component of the morning peak is lots of parents driving their children to school in cars. And Anna, of course, is right. Lots of people don't have cars. But I tell you what, a lot of people who do have their have children and they take them to school. 
Now, my experience, again, anecdotal, anecdata, is that is parents aren't doing that because that's the way they want to spend their time. They're doing it because there is no alternative that is safe and socially acceptable. Even Bloomin' America manages to take its children to school in buses. And I know of what I speak because I've lived there. And, and it is absolutely standard, normal and expected that your children go to a bus stop, get in a yellow bus, get taken to school, and it isn't done by parents. Now, that is, a, on one level, a trivially simple intervention we could make that could help people to have a better option than getting in their car. So I think it's partly storytelling, what's better than using the car, not taking your car away, but great news. I'm saving you from having to do that irksome journey that you don't really want to do anyway. But also it's about having a set of messages that are much more pinpointed. Where I live, flooding risk. Don't talk about climate change. Don't talk about climate crisis. You can't relate to it. Talk about flood. Talk about insurance. Talk about the, the things that you can do to, to, in, in, to uh, maintain your property prices. That gets traction. Thank you. Uh, Gillian? Thanks. Um, I, I, so I'm still grumpy, I'm afraid. Um, uh, I want to suggest, I mean, Andy's, Andy, uh, it's like when he talked, focused on metrics, the need for more metrics. Glenn's focused on um, the need to carry on, you know, uh, uh, making the link between what's happening and people's concern. And, and it's a good thing that people are more aware, more concerned. Anthony's talked about focusing on bottom up and consumerism. My, my feeling is that all of those things are only necessary conditions they're, they're not the actions that, that we're searching for they're the platform they're the foundation they're necessary but that's still not what we're talking about requiring um, to happen um, in order to change behavior concern itself won't lead to action um, uh, metrics won't lead to action if metrics led to changes in behavior we wouldn't have the car fleet that we have out on the road right now We've had people have made the link between miles per gallon and fuel consumption and that uh, fuel burning in cars is, has an environmental impact forever. I mean, it's not it's not difficult, just like people made the link between smoking and, lung, you know, it doesn't change behavior. People have to believe taking that example, people have to believe that the alternatives are actually better. And when you talk to people, as Glenn said, go and speak to those half a dozen people that aren't in your bubble, people really genuinely do not believe that electric vehicles are better on the whole. And they will listen to the stories about the, the social implications in uh, labor, labor market, what's happening to workers in Congo or the fact that, you know, we can't get hold of cobalt or whatever. They see those things and they understand the link in broad enough terms. They don't need to understand the detail. They understand the links in broad enough terms. So I, I, I still disagree uh, with the emphasis that a lot of people are talking about. Um, I, do, I do think that we do have more to do to convince people that um, there are solutions if they are done through policy, because it's policy that has to make industry act, that will be better for everyone and lead to cheaper and better lifestyles for everyone. That's Thanks, where now, we do have to make the links. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, yes, I, I agree that you have to, people have to um, understand that alternative is, is better, alternative behaviour is better for them. But the other leg of the stool is that people have to really feel there's social pressure to do something different. That's what was important in smoking. It was it was a feeling that it was no longer socially acceptable to smoke in public places. And that's when it stopped. Look, we've got about three minutes left. I'm going to bring in Suzanne and Greg, and then I'm really sorry, but we're going to have to wrap up. Suzanne. Very quickly, yes. I think what Anna said about the smoking campaign was for me the most, the profoundest thing we've said this morning. I think if there was one thing we were doing, it would be have getting the government to have some kind of 
um, communication plan, some plan about take about making alternative transport um, attractive and, and a lifestyle choice. Not because let's face it, electric vehicles all look amazing, and everybody wants one. Everyone's they, they are they make you look affluent and successful, and we need to we need to change that 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 mindset. Thank you. I mean, I suggest that even if everybody was totally convinced about the benefits of electric vehicles. The realities are it ain't going to solve the problem. The technical supply problems, the, the elapsed time, so, you know, all, all of the electrical, electrical distribution, it ain't going to do it. Anyway, Greg. I'm not, I don't necessarily agree with you on that point, okay. Stephen. I think they'll do an awful lot of the heavy lifting, but let, let's focus on the topic. Look, Einstein said that insanity is keep doing the same thing again and again yeah. and expecting a different result, Okay. I think as advocates, as experts, as transport planners, we need to start thinking about different ways that we influence the government decision-making processes. I don't think it's working the way that we've been doing things for the last 20, 30 years. It's clearly not working because there's more cars on the road and we've still got a 27 billion pound um, road building program. So for me, I think we have to collectively think about ways that we can work differently to have more influence over the key decision makers. And I would say that I, I would highlight two things that I think we should collectively do. One is that we should, you know, green advocates for, 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 for active and public transport should come together to work with the people that we don't normally work with in order to persuade the government to adopt a national road pricing scheme to work with the motoring organisations, to work with the car builders, to work with um, the, the people who traditionally oppose us in order to persuade government that there's a broad coalition in favour. That's one thing I would do. The second thing I would do is I think that, that we, we are stopped from doing so many of the local things that we know work simply by a lack of resources at a local authority level. There is good practice all over the country. It's just in isolated spots. So let's work to, to reinvigorate and re-resource our local authorities to give them the resources and capacity and skills to start to be able to implement the school travel planning and, and the workplace travel planning and things like that that will bring down the traffic levels at a local level. I think those are two things that we could do that I think would make a significant difference. Greg, uh, thank you. You've, you've um, captured a lot of the discussion in that. Uh, it's a really excellent way um, to summarise the, the session, including a mention of local authorities, which will be part of the discussion at next Monday's session. Claire, do you want to just take two seconds to give a trailer for next Monday? Yes, I, I'd love to. Thank you for plugging it. Also, um, to everyone um, who hasn't, please do fill in the survey. Um, we were, we're running a quantitative survey, so you hope you've seen that. Um, I've also just got to reflect. I mean, I'm, you haven't, thank you, asked me to comment um, because I couldn't, because there's just so much brilliant stuff has been said. Um, so I just want to thank everybody um, and Stephen for your brilliant sharing. I just want to thank everyone for this discussion. It has been absolutely brilliant. So yes, so Monday we will be looking at um, particularly the role of um, local authorities, the role of localism um, in driving forward decarbonisation. And in particular, and we have touched on a little bit today, I hope we will have a, a lot more in on Monday, is in, in that all important fair and just transition. We'll be getting a presentation from the IPPR, um, they're very influential work you'll probably be familiar with. I'm really looking forward to hearing from Luke on that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's going to be another really brilliant discussion. Um, what can I say? Make sure you sign up, make sure you come, and thank you to everyone. Thank you, Claire. And I would just like to apologise to people who sent in questions, and I haven't had time to explicitly um, have them asked. I think from what I've seen, uh, quite a lot of the questions that came in were indirectly addressed by the remarks that were made by the, by the panel. Um, but I'm, I'm sorry if we haven't been able to mention the names of the people who put those questions in. Anyway, do look at the recording of last week, uh, last session on Monday. Please attend next Monday. Hope to see you there. Thank you very much.